And that's, that's one of the things that I guess that, that worries me the most is listening to Jonathan speak last week, and I thought, wow, I got it. And then that self-doubt comes in after Jonathan speaks and I get home and I start going through all the stuff that I've thrown together and I go, I'm just asking you, Lord, to, to speak through me, Lord God, that I, I am able to stand aside and that you would flow through me, Lord, and that I would be a blessing to you and to those that are here. Where Jonathan left off, well, my, my verses are in Acts 9, 23 to 35, but I'm going to back up a little bit up to the, to the beginning here of, of um, just at the end of 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jer Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul... On his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in members, living in the fear of the Lord. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydia. There he found a man named Emmaus, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, take care of your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So, when I read something, I'm always looking, there's always words that pop out at me as little things that, that really draw my attention. And one of the things that I really like is I like geography. I like to know places, where they're at, how they're laid out, what the lay of the land is. Like if I go someplace, I really enjoy getting in the vehicle or walking the, the premises to see what, what lays around. So we start here, going back a little bit here before... Uh, verse 23, starting with Damascus. The city is at least 120 to 150 miles away from Jerusalem. And that's a five to six day walk. And I got thinking about the expense of just the trip of food and lodging. Saul was taken care of on his way there. But once he stirred everything up and, and got the chop, he's on his own. So it's just the, the hidden expense of, of doing a, a ministry, or hit, in his case, the hidden cost 
We know that he didn't starve to death, but there must have been a heavy leaning on the Lord in trust. The title of my message is, is Crossroads. In Damascus, if you look at, I have a map in here someplace and I can't find it. Some of these cities, the major roads, because like where Jerusalem is, Damascus is, there's a mountain range, and all the traffic coming up from Egypt comes down to the right side of the mountain, and then it gets up farther and you have to cross through to get up to Damascus, which is on the, on the eastern side. But there's major, the major roads like where we find later on here in Joppa and, and Adea, there's the road coming up from Egypt and the road going back to Jerusalem. And here in Damascus, it's heading up into the northern kingdom. So Saul's, Saul's reasoning besides going just to the Damascus to get to the Christians, he's going there with the intent of cutting them off and spreading out into the northern kingdom. With everything up in all Arabia and everything goes up to Damascus. So his, his thoughts were beyond to cut them off at the pass. But God won the race. Looking back at, at verse 21, the word that really, really stands out to me is that word astonished. That word, you know, I, had, I looked it up, and it means to surprise or impress somebody greatly. And that's exactly what Paul did with that complete turnaround that God put in it by severing, knocking him off the horse, putting him into the, into the face of, of, those, of the Jews, the non-believing Jews. And an older meaning stunned, bewildered, dismayed, or baffled. And then just in those three verses right there, he turned that city upside down. And then we get to, to verse 23. <laughs> the word that really jumps out to me is many days. As we go to Galatians 1, 17 and 18, Paul there explains how long he was actually there up there through Damascus and everything. And it's a hundred or a thousand and ninety-five days. So and it, it brought back that my mind going shopping. I, I learned the dread to go shopping with my mom when we were little kids. Like I'm only gonna be in the store just a little bit. And it would be an hour. And and to a little kid to be stuck in a car back in those days you didn't have to had someone there telling you you had to have the windows down or you couldn't be in the car. They left us in the car. <laughs> Summer, winter, it didn't matter. But that thought of, of time. So the three years is, is how long Paul was up there. With Paul's conversion, he turned his attention back onto those who were the persecutors of the non-believing Jews. From this point, he couldn't go back. And then What's our world view? What's our word, word view? Is, is it says is don't burn your bridges of your connection. And that's exactly what, what Paul did here. They see his, his, these, the non believing Jews that he was going after, now they see him as, as, a, as a traitor. And one of the commentators that I was, I was reading, he's old school, but it says a turncoat. Does anybody know what a turncoat is? It's Benedict Arnold. That's a quote from back in the Revolutionary War, so that's going back. But that's what, that's what they seen Paul now. And this is where Isaiah eleven six makes so much sense to me. 11.6, the wolf will, will live with the lamb. Verse 24, Saul had gotten the Jews so enraged that they invoked the governor to set guards to catch him at the city gates. 2 Corinthians 11.32, 
King Achaeus, I think was his name. He's actually King Herod's father-in-law from Jerusalem. So that, that connection there. And then verse 25, but God had made a way for, fall, for, for Saul to escape, to get out of that, that persecution right there by lowering him out, out the window. And what I found really intriguing to me is there's two other examples of the same thing in the Bible. One of them is Joshua 2.15, where Rahab lets the spies out the window to, to get them away from the, the king and everything that's there that's trying to capture them. And then the other one is in 1 Samuel 19.12, and that's Micaiah, Micaiah that's uh, David, soon to be king, but David's wife, she lets him down. So God uses two women here, which is pretty spectacular in itself. And then I want to read from Samuel, Samuel 19, 19 through 24. First Samuel 19, where am I at here? 19, 24. 1 Samuel 19, 19 through 24. So we know what, what God did to, to King Saul. No, I mean, we, <laughs> we know what God did to Saul, not King Saul, but to Saul by knocking him off the horse because he was coming to persecute the, the Christians. Now we go, we go to Samuel, first, first Samuel 19, 19. Word came to Saul, this is King Saul, David is in Nauth in Ramah, so he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel, standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also, also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern of Pekhu, and he asked, where are, David, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naiuth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to those two areas. <laughs> But the Spirit of God came even upon him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to the Nauth. So how, how God baffled even that situation to stop persecution. It just, it just the similarities, they're, they're close, with the coming out of, out of the windows, and, and i just seen that, and it just makes me think of, of wow. Verse 26, lessons for us. This is where um, Saul is, is now, or Paul, is now going down to, down to Jerusalem. Lessons for us here is to see is Paul didn't go back into the same crowd or old associates, so associates to fall back into his old self or ways. And it's one of those things that people will, going back around the same mountain if you're getting back in with the same crowd of people. And that, to me, that really jumped out at me that he's not going back to see his old classmates. And right there, there but he tried, it says, to join the, the disciples, meaning he wasn't welcome with open arms. But the Christians in Jerusalem were also just as astonished as those in Damascus. What's it say there? Baffled. Three years isn't much time to forget pain and suffering. And in my case, you know, it got me thinking, it's been almost 40 years since I lost my dad in, a, in an accident. And that pain is still, boom, it's still there. I still have the thought of, of a phone call that, 
if a phone rings very late at night, I'm back there 40, almost 40 years ago. So here, here it's just been three years. So you got to know it's got to still be fresh in, in a lot of people if they've been, if their family has been persecuted, thrown in jail, beat, some of them killed. So you could see the apprehension of, of these disciples by not wanting to accept Saul when he comes in. But what I find, we get into verse 27, what jumps out at me is Barnabas. The trust they had in his word, in his, his word and his character is what God used to bridge that gap of the, of the, the self-doubt. That's an example of why it's so important to us to live a holy and a righteous life before God and man. We might be the only Jesus that someone sees. You know, somewhere in, in, in Proverbs, character is worth more than silver and gold. And that's, and that's where Barnabas Yes, his, main, his earlier in Acts, he's, it's mentioned the encourager. But I just see him as, as such a bridge there between bringing them to Paul to the, to, the, to the apostles. And in verse 28, the more he preached, the more doubt was removed from his new friends. And the more he preached, the angrier her old friends got. I want to go to First Corinthians. First Corinthians one eighteen. Eighteen and nineteen, I'm sorry. And this is Paul here saying this for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. And that's, to me, that's pretty much Paul saying that right here to, to these non-believing Jews. Peter is, is the only, you know, it says the apostle that Barnabas takes Saul to, to see. But it's actually only Peter. James is there, but, Paul, but Peter is, is the only apostle that he sees. Because in Galatians 1.19, Paul says that he only went and seen um, Peter. But the more the disciples seen of Paul moving and talking with Peter, their trust was, was more secure. But the more Paul talked... He also stirred up quite a hornet's nest. And that he's only there for two weeks. And he's got them to the point of the same thing that they wanted to do to him up in, in Damascus. They want to kill him. And then in verse 30, they, they with the Lord's intention there is, is to get, get Paul out of there. So they send them up to down to, to Caesarea is where Philip lives. And when they send them, unbeknownst to anybody, even to himself, but he's gone for, for fourteen for fourteen years before he ever comes back to, to Jerusalem. And I got here as a this is just me speaking, but it's a little side note. At this time was Paul going after the non believing Jews with the same fever and pitch and tone as he was going after the Christians in his old self. So is this a, a way of, of God getting Paul out of there temporarily because he still has intention for Paul later on, but they're sending him, they're sending him up to Tarsus, back to his home, his home city, his home territory. In verse 31, 
we have here living in the fear of the Lord. Everything that, that's going on here at the end of, of Acts, of, of that verse, living in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let's jump back to Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2, 1 through 13, you want to read. My sons, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk is, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who lead the straight path to walk in dark ways. So you could see there's things with living, living in the fear of, of the Lord. All of God's children should possess a holy fear that trembles at God's word and causes them to turn away from all evil with acknowledgement of his power and holiness and a dreadness of sinning against him and facing consequences. It is not a destructive fear, but a controlling and redeeming fear that leads to God's nearness and blessing and moral purity and salvation. Let's jump to, to Psalms. 31. We're going to do a few, few in there here from Psalms. Psalms 31, 19. How great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men, on those who take refuge in you. And then 33. Eight. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Psalm 85, 9. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. You know, and I, I, I wrote down for all those blessings right there for those who fear him. If you jump back to, to 49, it's like, wow. You have blessings, and then you can go to 49, 20. A man who has riches without understanding is like the beasts that perish. So you could gain the world and then be forgotten forever. And we get into verse 32, and what jumps out at me is the word saints. I was brought up Catholic. 
So saints were just the statues that were up on the wall, you know, up on, on the little window sills. It wasn't any one of us. It was just, there was only like St. Paul, St. Michael, St. Gerard. That's all there was. That's, that's who was referred to us. We were never in, inferred, told that we were saints. It was just, there was just a certain handful that were saints. So Psalm 16 Sixteen three, as for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. Thirty one. Twenty three. Love the Lord, all His saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud He pays back in full. Eighty-five, eight. Eighty-five, eight. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to His people, His saints, but let them not return to folly. And then, last one is Daniel. Daniel seven eighteen. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. So it's not just a, a handful of people that are saints. All of us are saints. Those that are Christ followers, God followers, not statues. And then we got Peter here has the freedom to move about and bless and encourage the brothers and sisters in the faith. And it made me think of, of Jim Johnson. Just, I mean, not that Jim Johnson's, you know, Peter, but just that freedom not to be tied to a congregation like Pastor Davis here. Peter has, has the opportunity to go out and, and to be a blessing to all the other little churches that are around, the different little towns that, He's not tied, but he's not tied to a congregation, but to, to the overall church. And then we get here in the same verse, the town of Ladea. That's another major crossroads city. And actually today, it's the site of, of Israel's major national airport. So now, Paul is out of the picture. He'll, he'll be gone 14 years before he comes back to it. So Peter, Peter now takes over as the main character. And Peter finds Aeneas and tells him, Jesus Christ heals you, taking credit off himself. So he's not, he's not doing it. Peter, I'm telling you, Aeneas, to stand up. No, he's telling him, no, Jesus is, is, is who's telling you to get up. And you notice two things here. The healing, it wasn't a partial. It wasn't, hey, you're healed. Come back in another week, and you get the rest of your healing. It was completed, right? Before, Saul, or before Peter was done speaking to Ananias, he was healed. To me, that, that's the only places Jesus and, and Peter here, when they, when they tell somebody, just like when, when Jesus healed that, man that was lowered down in the, through the roof of, of actually Peter's house. Get up. Boom, he was healed. He was up running, just like this man. Boom, he was gone. Got his bed and, and, and was up. And Ananias was not a Christian believer. So there's another thing that, that really struck me. Ananias, because if we see the, just coming down another verse or two down, Somebody that's a believer, Peter mentioned as, as, as a disciple. But here, he's, he's not a Christian. 
But it took this man's faith in Jesus to stand up. So who was blessed? Not just this man, but all that saw and lived in the area. That word all. That's not just a couple people. All means everybody that's living in that land that lived and seen this man were saved. And I got down, what an altar call. Peter is, you know, when I, when I really start thinking back about it, Peter doesn't do any, he, nothing small scale. When people come to the Lord, it's not one or two, it's, it's multitudes. And it's like, it's like you could fill, you know, the, the uh, what used to be the Pontiac Silver Dome. It's like people were being saved like crazy. It's, it's not just such a small, minute number. And f- finishing, I, I want to finish with verse, um, I want to finish with 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God said, let light shine out of darkness. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Let's go ahead. So, that, yeah, so Peter just really thinking back that, and then even with Saul, the, the astonishment, and then with, with Paul, or with, then with Peter on how many people were saved here. He doesn't do anything in small scale numbers. We don't even know how many, but if there's two towns there, Sharon and um, Ladea, and Ladea is not a small town. It could possibly be as big as D- Damascus is because it's another one on, on a main thoroughfare coming up out of Egypt, coming up along that, uh, the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and then going to Jerusalem. So it's obviously not a small, small area. But Luke doesn't say how many here. But back in earlier part of, of Acts, he says how many people were saved. But here he doesn't. So I thought that was, to me, that was interesting. That's what I, that's what I've got for my uh, my study. Time. What really jumped out at me is the end of um, the end of, of, of 31, living in the fear of, of the Lord. That's something, because if, if we're living in the, in the fear of the Lord, I wouldn't be sinning. So that's something I got to take every every night when I say my prayers. I got to ask for forgiveness, and I think that's one of the big troubles that we have in our world, in our society, is that lack of fear. Because if if 
we were really thinking of the consequences and not wanting to, to mess up our relationship w- with Jesus, we really think twice about, about sinning. When we, we get into next week w- with Bob, it's, um, see the difference between Ananias and that. Yeah, I for some reason I just don't like that word. <laughs> Why mess up such a beautiful? I think Tabitha is such a beautiful name. Yeah, they they both mean the same thing, but it's like. Man, Tabitha is such a pretty name. <laughs> yeah. Tim, do you have a question? By God's grace, you know, God's God's grace puts puts a covering over us. But yeah, we, sh- we don't lose it. There wouldn't be anybody left here on earth if if God didn't have that have the grace for us. 